Welcome to the Comics and Lit Summary of Hamlet, Act 1. Act 1, Scene 1. The scene opens on the battlements of Elsinore Castle in Denmark. It is night time, and an officer named Bernardo comes to relieve Francisco of his watch. Soon, Marcellus, another guard, and Horatio, a nobleman, arrive and Francisco exits. Marcellus reveals he has invited Horatio to see a ghostly apparition which has been appearing over the past few nights. They wish for Horatio to speak to it. The apparition soon appears, and Bernardo comments that it looks like the old Hamlet, the dead king of Denmark. Horatio adds that the ghost wears the armour King Hamlet wore in battle with Norway, then explains how old King Hamlet had defeated Fortinbras of Norway and taken possession of his lands. According to Horatio, the young Fortinbras, prince of Norway, seeks revenge for his father's defeat. The ghost appears again, and Horatio urges it to speak and tell them about the dangers to the kingdom of Denmark. The ghost remains silent and disappears as the cock crows for dawn. Horatio decides that if it is truly the ghost of the old King Hamlet, they should tell young Hamlet, the king's son, reasoning that it will speak to him. Analysis This scene serves as a tense and dramatic opening to the play, establishing a foreboding sense that everything is not right in the Kingdom of Denmark. Horatio compares the arrival of the ghost to the supernatural events which preceded the death of Julius Caesar in Rome in the lines, A little ere the mightiest Julius fell, the grave stood tenantless, and the sheeted dead did squeak and gibber in the Roman streets. Shakespeare uses this allusion to one of his own plays, Julius Caesar, to create an atmosphere of fear and foreboding, playing on the commonly held belief at the time that supernatural events were omens, predicting violence and turmoil in his country. The ghost therefore functions as a symbol of fear and anxiety, and foreshadows the confusion which will follow in the play. Act 1, Scene 2 King Claudius, the brother of old King Hamlet, addresses the court with his new wife Gertrude, who is young Hamlet's mother. Also in attendance are Prince Hamlet, Polonius, Claudius's advisor, and Polonius's children, Laertes and Ophelia. Claudius mourns the death of his brother, but also stresses the need to focus on the future. He explains his marriage to Gertrude, commenting, with mirth in funeral and with dirge in marriage, in equal scale weighing delight and dole suggesting the pain of death is intermingled with the hope for the future that new marriage brings. He then addresses the threat to Denmark posed by Fortinbras of Norway, who had written to him demanding the return of the land King Hamlet claimed after the battle. Claudius dispatches a letter with two Norwegian courtiers to Fortinbras's elderly uncle, urging him to stop his nephew's plans. Next, Claudius gives permission for Laertes to return to his studies in France. Then the king and queen turn their attention to Hamlet. How is it that the clouds still hang on you? Encouraging him to stop grieving for his father, which Claudius calls unmanly. They convince Hamlet not to return to his studies in Wittenberg, which was Hamlet's desire, and they decide to celebrate Hamlet's decision with a celebration. Claudius, Gertrude, and the rest of the court exit, and now alone, Hamlet laments that he wishes to die as he is bereft at the loss of his great father. He then fumes about the hasty marriage of Claudius to his mother, seeming appalled by Gertrude's change in affection and pronouncing the marriage incestuous as Claudius was her brother-in-law. He is then interrupted by Horatio, Marcellus and Bernardo. Horatio reports that he has seen the ghost of Hamlet's father. Hamlet is stunned and decides to attend watch that evening so he can speak with the apparition. Analysis Notice how Shakespeare immediately creates a sense of ambiguity around the character of Claudius, using contrasts in his speech. Claudius's reflections on his marriage contain oxymorons, which contrast joy and sadness. With mirth in funeral and with dirge in marriage, in equal scale weighing delight and dole. Here we can both admire Claudius's shrewd decision to secure his power through marriage. However, the action of marrying his brother's wife so soon after old Hamlet's death also presents him as an opportunistic and cunning man. 
Shakespeare employs soliloquy later in the scene as Hamlet, alone on the stage, speaks of his desperate sadness at the death of his father. Consider Shakespeare's use of imagery of nature to reflect Hamlet's dire state of mind in Oh, that this too, too sullied flesh would melt, thaw and resolve itself into a dew. He is essentially saying he wishes his body would melt away into dew droplets. Additionally, the word thaw implies he is inwardly cold, lacking the warmth of hope. Though Hamlet seems suicidal, he reasons that killing himself is an offence before God, and therefore not an option he can take. The audience is encouraged to sympathise with Hamlet's clear desperation through this outpouring of his inner thoughts and desires. Act 1, Scene 3 At Polonius's house, Laertes is preparing to leave for France. He warns Ophelia not to take Hamlet's promise of love for her seriously, arguing Hamlet's position means he must marry for political reasons, not love. Polonius then enters to bid Laertes farewell, and advises him at length about acting with honesty and integrity. As Laertes exits, Polonius echoes the same warnings about Hamlet, and orders Ophelia to stay away from Hamlet. Analysis In this scene, Shakespeare introduces the character of Ophelia, along with an intriguing subplot of a potential romance with Hamlet. Laertes is warning to Ophelia, Fear it, Ophelia, fear it, my dear sister, uses repetition of the word fear to express his protectiveness over her, but also to present his suspicion that Hamlet is potentially dangerous. Ophelia, in turn, is presented as obedient and somewhat passive. Her response to Polonius of, I shall obey, my lord, echoes the patriarchal views of the time that women were subservient to their fathers. Act 1, Scene 4 After dark, Hamlet meets Horatio, hoping to see the ghost for himself. The apparition duly appears, and Hamlet is aghast, and excitedly implores the ghost to speak to him. I call thee Hamlet, King, Father, Royal Dane, oh, answer me! The ghost beckons Hamlet to follow him. The others try to stop Hamlet, but undeterred, Hamlet exits with the ghost. Analysis This short scene again connects to the theme of the supernatural within the play. As the ghost appears to Hamlet, we see Hamlet act with a feverish sense of excitement and confusion, expressed in, Bring with thee airs from heaven or blast from hell, be thy intents wicked or charitable, thou comest in such a questionable shape that I will speak to thee. In Hamlet's response, Shakespeare uses oxymoron, contrasting heaven and hell and wicked and charitable, to express Hamlet's mixed feelings about the ghost. However, for Hamlet, intrigue trumps the reason of his peers as he ignores their warnings and follows the ghost into the darkness. Act 1, Scene 5 Alone with Hamlet, the ghost speaks to him, dramatically revealing how he was murdered and instructing Hamlet to revenge his murder most foul. The ghost reveals that he was murdered by his brother Claudius, who seduced Queen Gertrude and poured poison in his ear while he was asleep. The ghost also urges Hamlet not to act against his mother, saying he should leave her to heaven. The ghost disappears as dawn breaks, and Hamlet swears to remember and obey its words. Horatio and Marcellus then arrive, but Hamlet refuses to tell them what the ghost has revealed. He urges them to never make known what you have seen tonight. The ghost calls three times from beneath the stage to swear as both men give their word upon Hamlet's sword to keep the secret. Analysis In this pivotal scene, Shakespeare employs the conventions of a revenge tragedy, a popular theatrical genre of his time, where the main theme is revenge and its fatal consequences. Hamlet responds to the ghost's fateful message with, Haste me to know it, that I with wings as swift as meditation or the thoughts of love may sweep to my revenge. Here Shakespeare establishes Hamlet's character as a revenge hero, dutifully willing to avenge his beloved father's murder. Yet Shakespeare uses irony in the contradictory simile, swift as meditation, since meditation is by its nature slow. This presents Hamlet as ill-suited to the task. He is too cautious, 
to intellectual to truly act swiftly. By the end of Act 1, Shakespeare has set the wheels of the plot in motion and established the setting of Denmark as a state in turmoil, full of secrets, deception and supernatural confusion. Central themes of the supernatural, corruption and revenge are identifiable as the protagonist Hamlet is poised to take action, yet the audience is left in some doubt of his fitness for revenge.